to Mars would be incredible. You'd be able to set foot on an alien planet and where not many people have been before if you were second or third mission, and you could possibly be the first person if it were the first mission to Mars. Mars is an unknown place at the moment, and to actually explore it and learn about its past would be incredible. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, engine ignition and liftoff of the Delta II rocket with the Mars Exploration Rover. Well, I think Mars is fascinating because it is the first good place we can actually ask the question, are we alone? Where did life originate as we understand it? Because when Mars was born a long time ago, like Earth, we think it had all the right ingredients, the magic ingredients to start the process of what we know as life. There's excitement in the air here at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. A robot spaceship is about to land on Mars, and this is the place where they control it and where the pictures come in. Hi, I'm Bob McDonald, and we're here to catch the excitement of this landing and actually watch it happen. So keep your heads up, because we're going to Mars. Now, the only way to get around on Mars at the moment is by robot, and you're going to see some really interesting ones in this program. But before we go any further, we want to look ahead to the future. And I've gathered together some robot engineers here who are going to design some machines for the future exploration of Mars. So, like, how might you want to get around on Mars? Well, what, do you th what do you think? What do you think? Well, maybe, like, to fly over Mars? Yeah? What do you think? Flying. Flying, yeah? Dune buggy. A dune buggy? What do you think? I think we'll stick to the ground. Stick to the ground. Well, I want you guys to really use your imagination, and we're going to come back to you at the end of the program and see what you come up with. Are you up for the challenge? Yep. Great. Okay, let's get to it. When can you go to Mars? You can go there today. There are robots already there and you can explore Mars through their eyes. Humans have been invading Mars for many years. Not with people yet, but with bug-like machines that make the long journey through space to visit our planetary neighbor. And for the scientists who control the robots, it's a lot of fun. This business of exploration represents the very best our species can do. It tells us what we can be if we only work at it. And uh, it's really fun. I mean, it's exciting. Can you do anything more exciting than to go see a world for the first time? This is what it's like to control robots on Mars. You have to watch where you're going through cameras mounted on the rover so you see what it sees. The rover moves by the arrows. You click on them. Uh -huh. So if you click on the one that's on the right side, it goes to the right. Oh, that's neat. If, if you click on the one that's closest to you, that says back down. Oh, and it goes backwards. OK, so how do, you, how do you pick up a rock? Can you do that? You hit. I guess we have to hit, find one first. You though. hit. Yeah. You have to find one first. Yeah. <laughs> and then you hit the button that says so one, and it closes, oh, and, it closes. and it goes up. How hard is this? Very hard, because you can't look at the rocks. Because you're supposed to be somewhere else in the world. So you, you can only see what the robot sees. Huh? You don't see very much. It's just really small, isn't it? Right. <laughs> Like. If you think this is hard, try imagining controlling a robot that's millions of kilometers away on Mars. Well, in California, there's a place where they build and control these robots, and they get very different pictures on their monitors. <laughs> altitude should be approximately 25,000 feet, velocity 446 miles per hour. 
At this time, we expect the vehicle has gone subsonic. The Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California is where most of the robots that are sent to other planets from planet Earth are controlled. Now, there's a lot of tension in the air tonight because a robot named Spirit is about to land on Mars. People from all over the world have come here to witness the event, and we're very fortunate to be here, too. It takes about six months just to get to Mars. Nestled in their capsules, the robots wait out the long ride through the cold depths of space. But once they arrive, things get very busy and very tense because these robots have a bad habit of crashing. There's just a lot of um, holding your breath. A lot of, a lot of, you're going to hear, you know, hundreds of people here at the lab holding their breath <laughs> to find out what happens. And if it succeeds? Oh, then they'll be cheering. <laughs> Landing on Mars is not easy especially when you approach the planet traveling faster than a bullet shot from a gun. Well, basically using the atmosphere to help slow you down. We have to hit the atmosphere just the right angle. Too shallow, you skip out. If it's too steep, you burn up. And then you fly through the atmosphere. The first part is on an aeroshell and use the friction of the atmosphere to help slow you down. Expect a parachute deploy in five seconds. Four, three, two, one, mark. And then you pop out a supersonic parachute that brings down more of the velocity and start a series of events, which include firing retro rockets, uh, solid rockets on the back shell, as well as inflating the airbags. Uh, spacecraft reporting that heat shield has indeed jettisoned. Lander separation event has been detected. Spacecraft reporting lander is separated. We expect that we will lock, radar will lock on the ground in approximately five seconds from now. Current altitude 8,000 feet. Moving at a speed of 173 miles per hour, we are near our terminal velocity. Expected retro rocket ignition on my mark. Mark. The whole stack comes to zero velocity vertical. You cut the bridle and it bounces and it bounces, and it bounces, and it bounces, and we expect it'll bounce a couple of kilometers, one to two kilometers across the surface. Now six minutes, 37 seconds from atmospheric entry, still awaiting signal that we are on the ground. After the accelerometers read that the spacecraft has come to rest, it deflates the airbags, figures out which pedal is down, and it opens itself up so it's right side up, retracts the airbags, and then you're sort of ready to go. The current status is that we had momentary signals after the landing event was expected to occur. We currently do not have a signal from the surface of Mars. We are currently looking at the telecom displays to try to reacquire the signal. Deep Space Network tracking stations in Canberra and Goldstone are still searching for the primary signal. size model shows you just how big these Mars rovers are. Uh, this is the camera head on Spirit, and you can see that it's almost my height, and that's intentional. These are the cameras up here, and they're the, about the same height as my eyes, so that the pictures we get from Mars will look the same as though you were standing there looking around. Now, it's a wheeled vehicle, and basically it's a radio-controlled car, uh, something like this. Now, I know it doesn't look the same, but the principle is the same. Uh, the car has an antenna. Spirit has several antennas to communicate with Earth. And there's a controller. Now, how do you control a radio control car? Well, you turn a joystick or a trigger, and it goes forward, backwards, forwards, backwards, turn left, right. Whatever you do here, it hears over here. And it's all happening at the speed of light. Well, there's one big difference when you're talking about a Mars rover. The rover is on Mars, the controller is on Earth. So when you say, go forward, 
The radio signal from Earth takes 10 to 20 minutes to get to Mars. So the, the rover doesn't hear it right away. So it's gonna take 20 minutes from the time you say go till this thing actually starts to go. Then if it's heading along and it comes to a big cliff and you say, stop, it won't hear that for 20 minutes. So it means it'll go over the cliff. That means that these rovers have to be fairly smart. So they kind of treat them like dogs. So the rover looks around and the people on Earth say, hey, you see that rock over there? Why don't you go over and take a sniff? And the rover does that and tells us about it after it's done. They're fairly smart little beasts. <laughs> It's so far away that you actually have to plan everything out the day before. You have to carefully, you know, send those commands up, make sure they don't do anything bad to your spacecraft. And then you need to give your rover enough sense that it won't put itself in harm's way. So if it sees a rock that's too big to go over, it will actually stop and try to go around it. If it sees the edge of a precipice that it might fall off of, it will stop and wait and call home. Okay. Really? Yeah, yeah, it has to have enough sense or else it would kill itself. I mean, it doesn't, you know, it's just a bunch of metal, you know? <laughs> it doesn't know any better. Okay, so it's not entirely stupid then. It's not entirely stupid. It has a whole series of sort of insect-like commands. It says, if this, then this, if this, then this. And that tries to keep it safe. And you can actually set those parameters. So, so how much the wheel actually goes up and tilts, how much the bogey tilts, how much the whole spacecraft tilts. And that keeps it safe when you, but in, even so, you carefully determine a path. You give it X, Y's to go to and locations, and you tell it all the things to do with these instruments. Now, it's very difficult to do that because you're so far away. So basically, you're, you're stuck on Mars time. That's really the operational scenario. These things are solar powered, so they wake up in the morning and they go to sleep at night. So at the morning, we've got to be here, we're ready. In the morning, we send up the commands that we decided yesterday, and we told it what to do for the whole day. Basically, it does all of that, and you can't watch it. <laughs> there's no video, there's no movies, there's no nothing. <laughs> So now we've picked out this rock and we said, oh, this is just totally awesome. So we row all the way up close and then we, we need to get the rover sort of right, Drives over, right, right over there, right into this zone. And there's a series of hazard cameras right there. You can see them in stereo. These two here. These yeah. two little here. And they take a close up picture of the rock with this thing all deployed back underneath like that. So it's out of okay. the way. And it says, ah, that rock's perfect. Now I want to measure and look at that rock up close. And out comes the arm. This is the IDT instrument deployment device. Okay. And it rotates like this. And it has four instruments at the end. One of them is called a rat for a rock abrasion tool. Rat. <laughs> rat. <laughs> rat to We're gonna rat the rock. So you will actually be able to tell what a rock on Mars is actually made of. Yes, what the rock type is, what minerals make it up. From the minerals, we can tell the rock type. From the rock type, we can tell how it formed. And we can tell uniquely how it formed and the environment in which it formed. That's the real skill that geologists <laughs> have here. So here's what the landers saw when they turned on their cameras on Mars. Spirit, the first one to get there, landed on a flat, rocky plain with rounded hills in the distance. Can you see how the sky on Mars is orange instead of blue? That's because there's a lot of pink dust blowing around there. Spirit drove several kilometers across those plains, examining rocks, passing by some large craters along the way. Then it set its electronic eyes on the hills themselves, where it took on a new identity as a mountain climber. Higher and higher it went, sometimes skidding on the slope. Looking back, it could see its own tracks down below, leading back to where it landed. Spirit discovered that these hills used to be islands in a saltwater sea that once lay here millions of years ago. Opportunity, the second rover, landed on the other side of Mars and ended up rolling right into a little crater. We got a hole in one on Mars. It sniffed some nearby rocks, found strange looking little balls called blueberries. They looked like they were formed in water. Some of the rocks have layers like a birthday cake, again suggesting that here, on the opposite side of Mars, water once flowed over these plains. The rover left its little crater and drove over to a much larger one called Endurance. This big hole in the ground, dug out by a meteorite that hit Mars, is about the size of a football stadium. Spirit drove right down into the bottom. 
checked out the sand dunes there and looked at the layers of rock lining the crater's rim. These layers are a way of looking into the past to find out what Mars was like long ago. After climbing out of that crater, Opportunity had a look at its own heat shield that had protected it during its fiery plunge through the atmosphere. The shield was dropped before the lander touched down, so it hit the ground pretty hard, digging a hole and almost turning itself inside out. The story that both rovers tell us is one of a saltwater sea that once covered this planet, a sea that dried up long ago. The idea of water on Mars is not entirely new. In fact, a hundred years ago, astronomers thought that water on Mars was doing something very strange. It seemed to be running in straight lines. So, here we are stuck on planet Earth. Unless one of you wants to invent a rocket that travels a lot faster, maybe something powered by warp drive, we're not going anywhere soon. However, we can look for alien life down here on Earth using telescopes. And this particular telescope is famous for making Martians believable. This telescope was built by an astronomer named Percival Lowell, who built it specifically to look at Mars. And he believed that Mars was covered in a series of lines, straight lines, that he called canals. Now, canals are built by people. I mean, we build them down here on Earth to irrigate our farms and to move ships from one place to another. Well, if there are canals on Mars, there must be someone there building them. And if they can build canals, maybe they could build telescopes. Maybe they could look at our beautiful blue planet with all its water. Maybe they could build spaceships. Maybe they could come here and invade us and come and take our water. And that led to the whole idea of invasions from Mars. Invaders from Mars. He saw them land from outer space. He saw them capture innocent people only to destroy. Well, we've been to Mars with our robots, and we didn't see any canals, we didn't see any Martians, we didn't see any spaceships. Too bad, really. But what do you think would happen if we were to swing our telescope away from Mars and start to look at some other worlds? When we finally sent robots there, we didn't bump into any Martians, unfortunately, or see any canals. In fact, we didn't see any water at all. Percival Lowell was right. Mars is a dry desert. The whole planet is red because the rocks are rusty. Even the sky is kind of pink because of the red dust that's blown around on the winds. But while we don't see canals, we do see what look like rivers and lakes. There's no water in them now, but it looks like there was a time long ago when you could go swimming on Mars. If Mars has, has changed from a, from a warm, Earth-like, hospitable climate to an inhospitable one, that is a fascinating question. And you might wonder, could that ever happen to the Earth? And I think it's a very important question. How do planets change? How do climates change? Um, you know, has Mars lost a lot of its atmosphere? And if so, how and what exactly happened? If we learn we're not alone at Mars, and that we're not alone at either microbial level, little microbes in our bellies, or some other scale, that'll be profound. It'll change the way we think about ourselves. We may learn that we're from Mars. One of my colleagues would say, once we see that, if we do, we could ask, well, where did it come from? Did we come from Mars? Or likewise, have we already seeded Mars? These are the kinds of, you know, huge questions that can change the way we think about ourselves. If we knew today we're not alone, at any level, that may open the door to saying, my gosh, life is everywhere. We still don't know if there is or ever was life on Mars, so the robots still have a lot of work to do. In the meantime, Mars is a fascinating place to explore. It's only about half the size of the Earth, but it has huge canyons and giant mountains larger than anything that we have. There are cliffs many kilometers high, and a mountain more than twice as tall as Mount Everest. Mars is a cold world, where the temperature barely gets above freezing during the day and plunges to 100 below at night. You'd need a warm coat there. In fact, that coat would have to be a spacesuit because the air on Mars has no oxygen. It's made of carbon dioxide, 
so you can't breathe it. But that carbon dioxide does come in handy at the North and South Poles. There, it's so cold, the air freezes into carbon dioxide snow, dry ice. Imagine skiing there. Skiing on Mars? <laughs> you bet. You know, if you were to go to the South Pole or the North Pole of Mars, you would find an environment that looks a lot like this. Rocks, ice, and snow. And in fact, there are two different kinds of snow on Mars. One of them is the... Uh, <laughs> Same stuff that we have here, frozen water. But on top of that is frozen carbon dioxide. That's also known as dry ice. It never gets wet. That means there's permanent powder on Mars. Now, it is a little colder there than it is here. In fact, it's about minus 80 degrees. And there's no oxygen in the air to breathe. So my ski suit would have to be a space suit. But that's no problem. We'll just make it really flexible. Oh, uh, one other thing. The sky on Mars is not blue, it's pink. Let's get at it. So you start skiing just like you do here on Earth, but something feels a little different. You feel kind of light on your skis. And in fact, you are lighter because Mars is a smaller planet than the Earth is. You only weigh one third there what you do here. So if you're 45 kilos on Earth, you're only 15 kilos on Mars. So that means that as you make your turns and you hit bumps and things, you're gonna spend a lot more time in the air. Just imagine the fun you could have. And if flying is your game, how about taking a flying leap off of one of those high cliffs under a hang glider? Now, the wings of your glider would have to be much larger, but remember, there isn't as much gravity on Mars, so you could easily handle a big rig. The sights you would see are incredible. In the future, there will be lots of robots going to Mars, some of them Canadian. Orbiters will circle the planet looking for water and minerals. Landers will drill down into the surface to take samples. Eventually, one of them will bring a sample of Mars back to Earth so we can study it in our laboratories. Will we find life in that soil? Some scientists think there could be microscopic bacteria living on Mars. If we do find something living in the Martian soil, it will be the first alien life ever discovered and the first proof that we're not alone in the universe. Eventually, a new generation of robots will take to the air on giant wings or under huge balloons, wandering the planet, exploring hard-to-reach places like those big canyons and mountains. These robot explorers, they're going to move around just as the first astronauts will do. They will see the kind of things that the astronauts will see. They will live in the environment in which the astronauts will have to live. And we'll learn a lot. It'll help, it make, help us make it safer and easier for the astronauts when they do first go there, whatever that is. Every time there's a major mission to another planet, an organization called the Planetary Society holds this huge convention where hundreds of people show up to find out about, oh, the planet Mars and different ways of traveling in space, both now and in the future. Now, sending robots to another world is one thing. They can do a lot of stuff. But what about people? Well, some of the people at this conference think we'll have humans on Mars within the next 10 or 15 years. I firmly believe that we will send humans to Mars someday. I mean, there's nobody on this planet who is a bigger fan of sending robots to Mars than me. Okay, that's what I do. But even I believe that ultimately the best exploration, the best science is going to be done by humans. Mars is the place where we are going to determine whether humans can make it off of this planet. I mean, it's, it's our whole destiny is really, are we, are we a single planet species or are we moving outward? I think a good reason they should go to Mars is to find out if there's more stuff like if they keep getting oxygen and take pieces like of a few samples of like inside craters. Yeah, that's good. Would you go? No. There are lots of plans to send humans to Mars and set up a colony there. But before that, there's one little problem that needs to be overcome, getting there. 
Now, sending a spacecraft to Mars is not as easy as sending one to the moon. The moon's so close, it only takes a day and a half to get there. Not only is Mars farther away, but both it and the Earth are both moving around the sun. So Liam and I are going to do a little demonstration on a hockey rink here to show how you go from the Earth to Mars and back again. You are the sun. You're at center ice. Liam's going to be the Earth, and I'm going to be Mars. Now, the Earth is closer to the sun than Mars is, and the hockey puck is the spaceship. So let's start orbiting around the sun. Now it takes longer for Mars to make it around the sun because it's on a bigger orbit. In fact, it takes twice as long as the Earth. So it's only when the Earth and Mars are on the same side of the sun that you can make your pass. That little pass, by the way, takes seven months. Then once you're on Mars, you have to wait for the Earth to come back. That's a year. Then when the Earth is on the same side again, you can pass back and you're home. So just going from the Earth to Mars and back again is a commitment that takes about two years. That's a big trip. Good pass. Sending people to Mars will take a very large spaceship, something like the International Space Station. It'll be their home with enough room to live, work, and play during the long trip to Mars and back again. Once they land on the surface, take the first small step on another planet and plant the flags, they will be completely on their own. If something goes wrong, there's no chance of a quick rescue. They'll be like the pioneers of old who came to the new world and had to set up new homes in the wilderness. It'll take a special kind of person to go to Mars. What, you don't see yourself as an astronaut? Well, that's okay. You can still be part of a mission. Let's start with this one. What is it? Um, it's kind of like a car. It can also fly, and it has satellite and cameras to see where it's going. Are these jets on the bottom here? Yes. So it's like a hovercraft. Okay. Yeah. What about this one? This looks This is a dune buggy, and it runs on solar power. Oh, the, well, these are the solar powers here on, yeah. the, on the outside. Because you can't run it at night, though, right? <laughs> okay. What do we got? Uh, what's this one? It's like a glider that runs on solar power, and I have a little satellite. Uh -huh. on the bottom so it can go over steep terrain and big canyons that no um, land, land over. Vehicle. Yeah, so, okay, so you can glide down the canyons yeah. on Mars. That's neat. And what about this one? That looks really odd. Well, this one's um, it's powered by the middle wheel and it runs on solar power. It also has a satellite and um, a camera to see where it's going. Well, wow. lots of solar power, different ideas. You know, the important thing is that all of this technology is available today. And it won't be very long before we're building bigger vehicles that can carry people to Mars. Maybe you guys will be among the first missions to Mars. Maybe you will be the first Martian astronauts. Who knows what will happen? All we need to do is keep your heads up.